So I'll hit that right now and then we'll start. So good morning once again. I'm Amy Good, the program manager for the Community Education Center. I create programs to help students with career exploration. So today's session is going to provide you an opportunity to gain more insight and exposure um, in a few careers and assist you in analyzing your own future career choices. So at this time, I'd like to welcome our guests. We have um, Jim Wendell from the High Grade Inn and Christine Fink from Fink's Farm. Thanks. So, so welcome guys. Thank you. So we're just gonna start off by um, asking you some questions and then we'll open it up to the students and see if they have any questions. So um, Jim, do you wanna just start off by introducing yourself, telling us about yourself and um, your career path, like when you were in high school, sitting what you were thinking and you know, how did that bear out for you? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, my name's Jim Wendell. Um, I graduated Cameron County High School in 1983, uh, a long, long time ago. And uh, I can tell you when I sat in school, uh, I, I was into music and I wanted to go into music. Uh, and I did the first year. Um, I went to college. I changed my mind after the first year, realized that music was fun, but it's not what I wanted to make a career out of. Um, so I graduated with a liberal arts degree and, uh, went into, uh, ironically bartending, which then brought me to corporate America and, uh, corporate America is where I spent the majority of my career. Um, I've worked for an electronic publishing company, uh, in London for three years. Uh, I've worked in Chicago for a telecommunications company. <laughs> And then finally, I worked for the last 15 years of my life for, well, my re before retirement uh, for Subaru, the car company, uh, the manufacturer uh, in New Jersey. And, uh, and now I own a hotel. So, um, but I have to tell you, it's not what I thought I would do. Um, it's, it's nowhere close to what I thought I would do in life. Things just happen. Um, but I can give you some advice, uh, some really good advice is to make sure that you know, what you want to do is what you want to do. Because, you know, you don't follow the path of what you are good at. You follow the path of what you enjoy doing. Because you know, you're going to be doing it for the rest of your life. So uh, just, that's my background. So, uh, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a Cameron County High School graduate. And that's what I do. So All right. Your question. Yes, thanks, Jim. Uh, that was... You've done a lot, so you have a lot of experience yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, move on to Christine. Um, how about if you uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your path? Hi, good morning, eighth graders. I am Christine Shuckers Fink. I graduated in 93, and that was an excellent lead in, Jim, because my dad always told me, do what you love, and you never work a day in your life. Exactly. If you love what you're doing, it's all fun and games. <laughs> so in high school, junior high, I used to sit where you guys are at and look at the courtyard in between the squares and say, man, I really wish someone would plant a tree there. I'm so bored. I can't stand being in this room, but you probably shouldn't do that. But 10 years after I graduated, I did get to plant a tree in that square <laughs> and do the garden that's in the courtyards because I went to school at Penn State to become a horticulturist and I got there by my grandmother reading me the little golden book you know a day on the farm my mom dragging us to every pick your own farm from here to Missouri and I just loved it everybody said what do you want to do for your you know the same question do you know what you want to do for your li living I said I want to play in the dirt I've said that since I was four I want to play in the dirt so <laughs> band back to music it's fun they made us do a project for the marching band to go to florida so i went and did the tours of the world in epcot and absolutely fell in love with horticulture and hydroponics growing plants and water i came back i was all you know hyped up from that project i saw the landscaping behind the scenes at disney world on how they do all the instant landscaping at night just thought the whole thing was fascinating so i came back i said i want to go to school for horticulture so <laughs> that was a rough road but i got there 
I wasn't an A student. I was a nice, you know, get it done. <laughs> um, but I made it to Penn State and my dad said, don't change your degree, you know, figure out if you really like it. So I went all the way down to Reading, Berks County. They had first year horticulture. I was at a uh, branch campus for two years. I did horticulture straight from the beginning. Absolutely loved it. Fast forward 25 years later, I'm now finally obtained a USDA loan to buy my dream farm that I have been dreaming about all my life. So this will be our first growing season, our 59 acres on Fink's farm. Wow, so it might not get me yet, but it does eventually happen. <laughs> it does. So what have you been doing, you know, from then till, till now, till getting this farm? Um, a lot of different jobs. I've worked at landscape companies. I've done, I've, I was a manager at a landscape company. I did nurseries and sales. I had three boys that kind of like made me step back from the horticulture, but we've always played in the dirt. So we've always grown stuff or, or raised chickens and rabbits. My boys are old enough. They're in the 4-H. Um, my kindergartner came home because a 4 hr came in and said, hey, this is our rabbit club. And he was five. And he says, I'm going to be a rabbit farmer. He's 11 years old now. And he won um, best bred rabbit in the Crawford County Fair two years ago. So it's, it's amazing how one step can take you to another. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they were all kind of related, everything that you've been doing along the way. Yes, I've worked at a horticulture department in a, in a Bethesda Children's Home. So I did horticulture therapy with kids. I've done retail at Home Depot selling plants and talking to people. I've worked in the propagation industry at a small greenhouse in um, Ohio. So it's kind of like all those little bits of the puzzle have come together because I've learned from where I was at the time, what not to do, what I didn't like to do, or what, oh, that's a really good idea. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you both have like been many different places, done many different things. So that's, that's exciting to see um, how everything kind of your path along the way. Yes. So, Jim, uh, why don't you tell us, like, what, you know, and I guess you can speak for whichever, you know, if you want to speak about from your Subaru job or you're in, um, like, what does a typical day look like in, you know, in that profession? Yeah, I talk my Subaru job because I have to tell you, Christine is 100% right. When you find something you like to do, it's not work. And I have to be honest with you, we don't really find the high grade as work. That's kind of, that's what we are doing um, and it's what we like to do. So I talk to Subaru. Subaru is um, corporate America. And, I, and I, this is how, uh, what I would, just some advice I would kind of give. Just because, you know, I have to be honest with you, you don't have to set your sights when you're 18 years old or 16 years old on what you want to do with life. You know, life changes. What I was doing in my 20s is not what I was doing in my 30s. And you know, you kind of adapt, you go through life and you figure out what you like to do. And, um, but the only thing I can advice I would give you when it comes to any type of corporate America job is I was a strategy game person when I was in school. Like I like strategy. Um, I like thinking four steps ahead of everybody. Um, you become very good at that. And when you want to go into corporate America, everything is about strategy in corporate America. Everything is about staying four steps ahead of everybody. Um, my career in corporate America was project management. I would manage, manage really large uh, blue letter projects for the company. Uh, blue letter projects are projects that are cost, have a budget over $10 million, $15 million. Uh, I would manage those projects across the entire company. Um, uh, and I was a strategic planner for the company. So, you know, my job was not only to plan the project, but was to plan the project knowing what was gonna happen in three years. Like, uh, you know, was it going to blow up in everybody's face in three years? That's what my job was. And 
Uh, if you're a strategic person, like if you're one of these people that, you know, like to play chess, if you like to play, you know, risk, if you like to play any of these strategy games, you know, strategy is a fun thing to do. That was my hook. That was my hook for what I like to do. I like strategy. Like, I like knowing that in two years I'm right. That I was right. And uh, so it's all about, and I'm not a person person. So anybody who knows me, knows that I'm not a people person. I, you know, I like being around people. I prefer not to be around people um, because I'm kind of an introvert, but you have to suck it up and be a people person in corporate America and listen. Everything is about listening, listening to everybody, taking it in, whether you agree with it or not, you just take it in and you file it in your memory bank and you just kind of hold on to it. That's all what strategy is. And you know, uh, but my, my big press here is this, you don't need to decide, you know, you can kind of set your sights now on what you want to do, but I have to tell you, most people decide what they want to do and they stick to it, whether they like it or not, that's what they decided they want to do. And that's not what you should do. You know, you adapt as you go through life, just make sure that at the end of when you're ready to retire and I retired early at 55. When you're ready to retire, you are where you want to be and you are doing what you want to do. That's what's going to make you happy. Giving us some advice there. That, <laughs> that is, that's great advice. And I've never had anyone um, point out about the game, the game strategy. Like a lot of kids, you know, they're playing games and I get a lot of kids that say, I want to be a game programmer. But I'm going to start saying, well, let's look at, you know, maybe – if you like gaming, you know, you're strategic, look at corporate America. Yeah, like that's, that's an interesting very, concept there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a really good position to have at corporate America. If you're really good at strategic planning, you know, um, you'll go places in corporate America and it's, it's, it's a fun job to have because really nobody can tell you whether you're right or wrong, unless they have a crystal ball and can look into the future. It's strategic planning. So, you know, you're never right or wrong because, you're kind of predicting the future. So, you know, it's a, it's a fun job to have. So anyway, hopefully yeah, that answers it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Christine, how about for you? Um, you know, what is agriculture, you know, working in agriculture or on a farm, um, like a daily life look like? Ever changing. It's never the same every day. I mean, you're kind of doing the same thing, planting the seeds, putting the crops in, uh, harvesting, getting them to market, but it changes with the weather, it changes with the season. I do anything from put fencing up to build stairs, to build buildings that is being remodeled right now, to run drip line and plumbing. Sometimes I'm covered in water or chicken and stuff. It, <laughs> it's an ongoing project, but basically if you look at it seasonally, spring is plant and water and keep all the babies growing and hopefully have the first tomato to market or any vegetable first to the markets. Um, sprint, summer is your always outside. I think I put in probably a 14 hour day some summers cause the kids are, my kids are like, are we gonna have dinner? I was like, yeah, what'd you make me? Cause it's 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you pick pack um, the three P's. You pick it, you pack it, um, you plant it, because you have to always have ongoing crops for the seasons, they're changing. Um, most people, you just think they plant between June and August. Well, I have a greenhouse you can see behind me, which is only four by eight, and I outgrew that last month. So next year on our schedule is to have a 30 by 40 greenhouse. So I'll start planting. And then I got a grant for two high tunnels, which a high tunnel is an un unheated greenhouse. It's heated by the sun and you plant in the ground. So when I plant a tomato, it becomes a tomato jungle because I grow them up a vine. So I'm always in there pruning and picking and trellising and stuff like that. So sometimes you stop and play with the baby bunnies or play with the chicks or stuff like that, but it's all fun. Um, 
I would say along to the lines what Jim was talking about, I met a career coach and um, her name was um, Christy Marie Sheldon, I think. Can't remember her last name. Anyway, she said, have a plan, get a life. Make a plan, get a life. And then you ask yourself, what would it take? And then you write down all those steps. So when I was in kind of this life coach kind of thing class, you know, that's what I exactly had, what I had to do was make a, I think it ended up being a 157 page paper uh, for the USDA in order to obtain the farm. So paperwork is not high on my like <laughs> list, but it has to be done. <laughs> So in the fall, I'm always um, wrapping up the season, starting to plant the fall crops. Once they have the high tunnel, you always have the um, cold crops. I've been growing spinach and a lettuce mix all winter long in just a raised bed and a piece of plastic. So being a farmer is also like putting a big puzzle together. If you like puzzles, you're always trying to find where this piece fits, where that piece fits. Um, I do anything from marketing labels, cost analysis, uh, planting, picking is a big thing because you have to have something to sell when you're a farmer. So did I answer the question? Yes. <laughs> yes. And then some, because one of my questions was going to be what, you know, what don't you like? And so you said you don't like the paperwork. Paperwork <laughs> is like nails on a chalkboard, but it has to be done. <laughs> um, so Jim, like I, I th you told us um, that you like strategic, strategic planning. So um, what, what, do, what don't you, what didn't you like about the corporate world? I have to tell you, uh, my last five years at the corporate world for Subaru, I probably was on conference calls and video calls, video calls the last three years. Probably out of my 10 hours, I would be in the office a day. I'd probably be on video calls, five of them, six of them. I'm, <laughs> and uh, nobody here knows me, but I'm the type of person that I hate small talk. I hate, like if I'm in a meeting, I'm, I'm, I'm the project manager, so I was the one in charge of the meeting. Um, I hate meetings. I really hate meetings. <laughs> like I'm one of these action people, but life is meetings in corporate America. I have to tell you, if you ever go into corporate America, you're literally two thirds of your life is in a, in a conference room. Um, it's ridiculous. But I'm one of these people that crack the whip. You know, I'm one of these people that if you're talking about something and you want to talk about your kids, I'm the one that like cracks the whip and tells people like, move on, let's go. We have like you know, I, I don't build my meeting. I don't have 60 meeting minutes and say, okay, we have 60 minutes. Let's just talk for 60 minutes. I'm more of a, we have this much to talk about and we have 60 minutes. Let's see if we can do it in 10. <laughs> so, because I just, meetings. Meetings are the bane of my existence. Um, and I would say out of everything that I've ever done, that's the one thing in my job that I did not like. Otherwise, I, I just love my job. It was just time to retire. So. So did your job take you to other air? Like, did you get to travel with your job at all? I traveled. Uh, my first job uh, with the publishing company, I traveled back and forth from Europe to the United States every month. Um, traveling with them was really monotonous. It's traveling sounds like a lot of fun for a job. I could never be a salesperson in travel. Uh, it sounds a lot of fun until you actually have to do it. And you have to stay in a hotel room that you aren't familiar with every night. Um, you know, you have to eat at a restaurant every night and it sounds glamorous to a lot of people. A lot of people used to tell me like, that sounds like so much fun, but I'm telling you, it is miserable. And if I was a salesperson, that would be the thing that I would probably hate the most. Um, but yeah, for Subaru, I didn't have to travel a whole lot. I went to their dealer shows. Like we, I didn't work for a car dealership. I worked for the manufacturer. So I would go to Las Vegas on the trip every year. Uh, and I would do those types of things, the fun things. I did fun things. I also managed their incentives department. So, you know, I'm the one that was in charge of all those commercials you see on TV that says, we'll pay you $1,500 if you buy a Subaru today. I was that one. So, um, yeah, I was in charge of that too. But I love my job. I just really love 
my job. And that's what you need to do is find something you just really like to do. And it no longer becomes work at that point. I mean, the reason I retired, my, my four mile commute took me 45 minutes, four miles. That would be like driving from here, less than from here to Truman. And it took me 45 minutes every morning. And it took me 45 minutes every evening. That's how long it took me to get there to work and get, that's primarily the reason I retired. I just couldn't do it anymore. I don't, it's just burned you out. So, but yeah, that's the only thing I didn't like uh, were meetings. I love my job. I can definitely relate. I, there's, I do a lot of meetings too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you, I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Christine, have you, does your job require any, you know, traveling anywhere or going to any shows or anything like that? Um, yeah, I travel mostly in the summer because I travel to markets. So I sell up in Erie. Right now, I'm located by Conneaut Lake, which is right off of 79 by Meadville. Um, I travel to Erie on Mondays. I travel to Meadville on Saturdays. We're going to have an on the farm shop this year. So my one son will run that because he's into the business marketing managing hopes to have a coffee shop someday so i'm like hey here you go here's the setup um i like to travel to emporium because i still have family there and everything and i like to support my hometown so i'm in the process of working with the chamber of commerce and stuff to try to get an official farmer's market set up every other friday um to sell produce and stuff like that to the hometown. So I'll travel back to Emporium. Um, pretty much farmers are homebodies. We like to stay home and that's a good thing because it's a 24 seven job. You have to feed the rabbits, you have to feed the chickens, you have to be here in the gardens trying to keep them growing. So I prefer not to travel. <laughs> so I like it, but there is a, if you want to, there is a wonderful organization when you're young and you want to learn a lot about the farm life and stuff. There's a wonderful organization called Woofers, W-W-O-O-F, the Worldwide Organization of Organic Farmers. And they have a website and farms will take you in and you will work the farm for, um, a small like weekly stipend they call it they'll give you a room and board and then you're just totally submersed in that you can go anywhere in the world i had um one friend that was with me at market and she was in she spent a summer in brazil working she spent a summer in europe working as a woofer and all over the united states so if you like traveling there is opportunity um I would suggest do it while you're young because <laughs> that's the most fun time. And, um, but I mean, horticulture and agriculture is such a diverse kind of career niche. You can be working in a lab, you could, you don't have to be playing in the dirt. I mean, there's just so much diversity. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for mentioning that um, organization and that opportunity. That sounds really, that sounds like fun as a young person to go, go travel. Yeah. And, I would yeah. have loved to know about it. That would have been awesome because you get the experience, like much needed hands-on experience that you would. Cause like I went to Penn state for the four years and I have a horticulture degree, but it was very book. And there was some hands-on I got uh, to work in a greenhouse and stuff like that when I was at Penn State. So, but I think that would be the adventure to go farm hopping. <laughs> All right. Well, I think at this time we'll throw it out to the students and see if they have any questions. So, Mrs. Tronzo, does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Really? They're only moderately awake, I think. Some yeah, of them. <laughs> it is. I have, I have a question to wake them up for the students. How many colored eggs are there? How many naturally colored eggs are there that you can get from chickens? Yeah, so like she's asking like how many 
how many different colors eggs? What do you think, Nevaeh? Three? three? Yeah, because they, 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 they have rainbow chickens, don't they, or rainbow eggs? Easter eggers or Americanas. I, if I could get them open, I'll show you. This is I my kids. This is my middle son's 4-H project gone haywire. Can you see them? Yeah. One, two. <laughs> what are they like? Green, blue, brown, dark brown, olive, white. <laughs> so how does that happen? It depends on their genetics, on which genetics. kind of variety of birds they are. So we have over about 40 different varieties of birds in our flock, and they all lay a different color. And you can tell by their ear flap in the back on what color of egg they're going to lay. If they have a white one, then it's going to be a light green, blue, white. If it's a darker one, it's going to be a brown. Hopefully, I'm getting the duck soon that'll lay black shelled eggs. Wow. Oh, wow. So, how many yeah, I don't eggs have any, do you get I don't a have day? <laughs> Pardon me? How many eggs do you get a day? Um, it depends actually on the light. Like at, in the winter, when it's darker, you get less eggs. So, in the summer, right now, I'm averaging about 40 eggs a day. And I sell to restaurants and I sell to a retail shop in Edinburgh. And we eat a lot of eggs, so that's good. But we sell a lot too. So it's really, um, that has to do with the 4-H project where my kids started it. And then that was one of his projects. We created the label for the farm. It's backwards, okay. but. My 10 year old created the label at the time. And now he sells probably about $350 a month. The difference. Wow. wow. Yeah. So wow, he's supporting awesome. his project of raising chickens. So you don't have to be older. You don't have to be younger. The USDA actually has amazing grants for students to get involved in agriculture. You can take a loan out, you can buy beef, you can sell it at auction, pay the loan off, make some, I know a gentleman that actually paid his way through college doing that. Wow. Wow, awesome. You're so just giving out all kinds of information today. <laughs> I want to be a farmer. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the pandemic that we're actually important now because yeah. everybody yeah. likes food. <laughs> so let's talk about the future. Like, so the future in agriculture, farming, you know, how do you see that? I see it being much more knowledgeable and important these days because of what we went through last year. Um, my one saying to the boys is bad things happen for a good reason because we have to look outside the box. We have to see the world differently. So I think, you know, what we had to do last year was an eye-opening experience, but I think it also brought to light that we need immediate food. We need our communities to be supported. We need to support the farmers. And there's a very low people going into the farming versus what's being retired. And that's how I got this farm. This gentleman lived on this farm for 65 years. I found it when he was... Um, beyond retirement and his son was selling it and he really was adamant about having another farmer come on this property and keeping it alive you know we become very attached to our land we become very attached to the passion of it it's more of a lifestyle than it is a career actually yeah well, and we have a great area. I mean, we live in a great area for for farming and agriculture. So there's a, a lot of different business opportunities for the young students. Um, and you don't need a lot of space. I have some urban farmers that grow on a 40 by 100, less than a football field, half a football field. They grow and they make quite a nice salary doing that. Yeah. So Jim, let's talk about, you know, future careers. 
the future yeah. of your industry. <laughs> well, yeah, that changes on a daily basis. Um, last year was very good to us uh, when it comes to the pandemic. Last year, when it came to uh, the hotel industry in Cameron County, uh, Cameron County benefited. Um, I, I can speak for everybody who has any type of rental that the occupancy rates for you know renting places up here was astronomical last year. Um, everybody came to Cameron County to get away. And the one thing that did, and I'm speaking from my high grade hat here because this is the way I'm going to be living my life now. Um, that is not going to change. That's just going to be you know the same way this year. And even if you know everything goes back to normal, it put Cameron County and Cherry Hill and or Cherry Springs and the Elk, it put everything on the map. I mean, 70% of our customers came from New York City, Philadelphia, Washington, DC, Pittsburgh. They came from a metropolitan area. People from New York City drove one day, one night, eight hours to go to Cherry Springs and they turned around the next day and went home. So that's the only reason they came here. They got here at 10 o'clock at night, went to Cherry Springs, got up at six o'clock the next morning and drove back to New York City. Um, we've had multiple people do that. Um, I think in the future, Cameron County is only going to become uh, more, uh, much more of a tourist attraction. Um, you know, I look at it five years ago or 10 years ago, and now it has propelled itself so far in 10 years uh, from what it was 10 years ago. Um, and I think it's just going to get, it's just going to keep getting busier and busier. There's very little real estate available in Cameron County right now. Everybody just wants to be out of a city. That's, I mean, I have friends who want to be out of a the city. They, they just want to be out. So, um, yeah, I think the future is bright, at least for us. Um, we opened, we're opening our gift shop. We're probably going to ultimately open another retail store. And my goal down the line, uh, because the high grade does have a commercial kitchen. Um, we installed a, we probably have the nicest kitchen of any restaurant in our region, uh, but we just don't use it. It sits empty and it's used as storage. Our refrigerator has dishes in it. Everything is just used as storage. But ultimately down the line, there will be pop-up restaurants on a monthly basis, hopefully starting in the fall. Um, comfort food that would, you know, kind of put meat on your bones, like, like macaroni and Jim, cheese. Jim, how about... Stuff and Jim, how about a farm-to-table dinner? I would totally do that with you, and I was going to tell you to stay on here after everybody else hangs up. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You guys that, can eat what I grow, future. and he'll cook it. <laughs> yeah, our future is bright. We, I, um, I, I never, I, I'm, everybody who knows me, this is everybody's favorite word to describe me, squirrel. That's where everybody looks at me and goes, squirrel, because just because I set my sights on it today doesn't mean tomorrow it will even be on my mind. Um, I could go off in some completely <laughs> different direction. I make people's head spin on a regular basis. They're like, wait a minute. I, but, you know, you have to adapt all the time. So, you know, you adapt to your mm -hmm. changing environment. Never but changing. I see us, yeah, I see our footprint just growing uh, in, in Emporium. So that's, that's what I see our future as. Um, we're in a good position right now, so. Yeah, I'd like to add, like, for the students, um, you know, tourism in our area is becoming very hot. And as both of our guests have said about um, finding something that you love, if there's a sport or an activity that you love that you could turn into a business, um, by all means, our area needs that kind of thing. Um, you know, we hear all the time, there's nothing to do here. Well, take something that you love doing and create a business um, and other people will come, come also. So that's something I could, give people, think about. I could give people a list of 10 businesses that they could start locally that would be a hit just solely based on feedback from our guests that don't exist in this town. And there's things that students could do. Literally, if you had somebody that did nothing but pick up tourists with kayaks down at the end of the stream, you would be busy all summer long. That's the one question we get from everybody. Is there anybody around here who actually will take you kayaking on the river or Dine County will, can pick you up? That was, that's one of the, the biggest things. Is there anybody around here who can take us on a wine tour, who can take us to the wineries? All somebody has to do is organize some wine tour in the region. If you know what you're doing and you talk to the wineries, 
the wineries will bend over backwards to have you bring guests to their winery. I mean, there are all kinds of things that you could do in Cameron County, and if you wanted to stay in Cameron County, that you could start your own business. It's just that I found that people, if you don't leave Cameron County, you don't see the bigger picture. You don't really see what people are wanting that are coming back into Cameron County. And, and you know, I, I'm telling people all the time, there's just a list of things you could do because we're only getting busier. We're not getting any slower. And it's not going to slow down. It's only going to get busier. So just my advice. It can be small things. Like it, yeah. can, it can be the smallest things. You guys are, um, I hear a lot, you know, of the younger kids that I'm still in touch with in Emporium is like, there's nothing to do. Well, I was never there's one of lots those kids. to do. <laughs> I mean, I was one of those kids. Walk up and down the street. Um, you know, like with the industry of the tourism and stuff, you know, there's so much opportunity and you don't have to be older to get business grants and loans. I mean, the miniature golf place that used to be there forever, that was always possible. That was always packed. Miniature golf, mm -hmm. a paintball, we get, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's what will it take? Make a plan yeah. and what will it take? Make a paintball arena. Oh my gosh. They have multi million company up here in Erie just because people want to come and play paintball. So it yeah. could be something as simple as that. Ironically, paintball was the other option instead of the high grade. It was a high grade or a paintball. We were going to buy an old building, turn it into the top of the line paintball arcade, um, which actually gave my husband at the time cardiac arrest, like the thought of doing that. So the alternative was the high grade. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, but paintball would have went really Yeah, if this well doesn't here. work, paintball you know, a lot of the farmers, they get out of the business and they start a golf course because we have yeah. all the land. So, I mean, it's sad to see a farmland go because we need that resource for food. But if you're not making the money, then you have to adjust or adapt, like yeah. you had said, Jim. Um, but yeah, my kids all like, we're making a skate park because that's what I'm into. I was like, okay, I'm going to build a skate park next week. <laughs> yeah. But there is all kinds of opportunities, all kinds. You just have to kind of talk to people. So, you know, if you ever get to a point, this would be my suggestion to you. Don't be afraid to talk to people. Like anybody, I, apparently I'm an intimidating person because people who talk to me tell me that, but I am always up for talking to anybody. I am all about business. I'm all about bringing business to Emporium. And I am all about helping anybody with any type of good idea. Everybody in this town knows that, that I would be willing to help anybody. And if it was an awesome idea, I'm always up for helping anybody, especially if it comes to helping Emporium. Like, no idea is a bad idea, I can tell you. I just know that people have a habit of being afraid to step outside of the box in our community. Barb Williams, I don't know if anybody knows Barb Williams, she wrote a child book, a children's book. I called her a children's article on her Facebook page. She was totally embarrassed. And I told Barb, you did what everybody else wants to do, but nobody else has the guts to do. You just have to step outside of your comfort zone and, you know, do your thing. But uh, my advice yeah. would be is just to talk to people. If you have an idea, talk to people. Your idea is going nowhere if it stays in your head. So, you know. That's good advice. Networking is the key. Once you know people or you talk, you know, the guidance counselor can help you look outside the box. You know, talk to anybody, anybody. Look on the internet with the woofers or I'm actually part of the PASA group, which is the Pennsylvania Agricultural Sustainable association and um i'm gonna have apprenticeships here on the farm hopefully either this year or next you know so there's always someone that you want to connect with and now i'm getting rained on and this is what my job is like every day the weather changes <laughs> <laughs> um but uh networking is huge talk to people if you have an idea you know what would it take how do i make this happen i waited i think the biggest push for me to actually say i'm not on this earth to live a mundane life of not doing what i love and that was breast cancer like i went through all the treatments i'm great but i was like i am not gonna do what i have been doing i want to do what i want to do 
and then it all changed you know because you need that confidence you need that passion like i really want to do this i really like this this is what i want to do yeah i don't want to you're a happier that, person but our um our class period is going to end in about a minute so. <laughs> okay did the kids have any last minute questions do you guys have any last minute questions for them they're still very chatty <laughs> <laughs> it's early um, well, I want to thank you both for joining us to this morning. Um, it was a great session. You gave the kids a lot of great advice. Um, so thank great. you. We really appreciate it. Christina, stay on the line. Can you stay on the line for a minute, Amy, after yes. students yes. hang up? Yes. yes. Thank you guys very much. Thank I you. Really appreciate thank you. I wanted to tell you. Have a good day. You too. Thanks, Thanks. a lot. Bye. Bye. So Christina. Yes. I have an entire empty lot at the high grade. Um, really? And you wouldn't need the, you wouldn't need the chamber's permission to put your farmer's market on it. And it would be my nice way of kind of going eh, to the chamber. So if you would like to talk to me about putting your farmer's market in my lot next to the high grade, immediately next to the high grade, across the street from every church in town. Yes. I know where you're out. at. I would be, I watched I your model that building. To talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah, that would I be would wonderful. Be... Yes. That would and be it's great. Just for empty. We've been trying to figure out what to do with the yard because um, it just sits there empty and it's a pain to begin with. It's just, I just need to do something with it. Um, but in the interim, I'd be totally up for talking to you about that. And I, we're looking to do something every second Saturday for two days um serving oh food. yeah that's what delivery. they do here the the yeah the Just art delivery. council we also, here we also have, yeah we also have a porch so you could eat on the porch i just we want to do delivery and pickup but i want to do good food not fried food um mm -hmm. i would totally be interested in working with you to do that too i need to our kitchen was set up by the department of agriculture like i sent them all the plans Perfect. i did everything that they asked us to do um mm -hmm. i just never had I never had it come in and inspected, but I know it'll be a slam dunk because they signed off mm -hmm. on everything. Um, so all yeah. I need to do is do that. And uh, I would totally be up for talking to you about that because Emporium needs something that has really good food. Yes, I do. It, it, it <laughs> is technically, yes, it is technically in the USDA called a food desert because of the transportation yes. for the actual agricultural prog you know, production there. Um, my other friend is part of the USDA that gives the, you know, WIC harvest senior, the farmer's market harvest checks. There's yeah. a state funded program and they all get wasted because none of the farmers will come in. And, you know, I've had people say, you know, I'm giving this 40 bucks to feed my kids good food, but there's no place to to well, an emporium claim is it. hard. Emporium is hard on the farmers market because they knocked down some buildings in the middle of town, which would be the perfect area for a farmers market. But the borough won't allow a farmers market on it because they said it violates the terms of knocking down the building and what it can go for, like uh, what it can be used for. It has to be used for certain things. I, I, don't even get me started. So you could use. Oh, the, that's the. Oh, is that the lot between the? Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. Okay, that's, that's where they were saying yeah. to put it. Oh, yeah, you're going to be like, yeah. you'll be in a conversation with them for the next five years. Uh, Josh Zuckel yeah. tried to get into a conversation with them three years ago about this, and it just goes nowhere. Uh, the winery wanted to use it during, um, during one of the festivals. They weren't allowed to use it, so now they're renting the slim piece of land right next to the uh, Midtown because it's not owned by the town. To put their stuff on so okay. just so i could just kind of do the whole uh, to you you can knock yourself out and use the high grade to your because i have to be honest with you they don't want food trucks at the weekend in the wild the chamber doesn't so i actually considered allowing the high grade yard to have a whole bunch of food trucks parked in it at weekend in the wild just because it doesn't make any sense they're very anti-competitive no. around here 
you know. Um, the good thing about mm-hmm. the high grade is they have no say over anything I do, so I don't care what any of them think. Uh, I told somebody mm-hmm. uh, from the local government that when – actually, somebody from the local government made a comment to my mother one day that said I should keep my mouth shut on Facebook because I'm a very loud mouth on Facebook about certain things because it could hurt my business. And surprisingly, my mother looked at them and laughed at them and said the day you start renting rooms from Jim is the day he'll start caring about your opinion um mm-hmm. and that's pretty much my take on emporium is anybody who's a local official who you know thinks they wield any type of power I could give a crap about them because they have nothing to do with my business like they have nothing to do with my business they don't bring customers mm-hmm. in they don't do anything you know I do more of a favor for the chamber than the chamber does for me so mm-hmm. You know, if you have any hard time, I would totally give you that. I don't even charge you. You can just come and put your freaking farmer's market on it. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Uh, it sits there and does nothing. Uh, and I think yeah. it would be really okay. good for Emporium. Yeah. That's, you know, and it would take a, and it would take a few know. people off. Yeah, it would take a few people off yeah. that I would just love to take off. So. Mm, yeah. Oh, I know the anyway. Emporium mindset. If you don't have the right name, then you're not in the right game. Yes. Well, that, that changed kind of with me so I don't really care I have a bad attitude when it comes to that so yeah. <laughs> you know I do what I want to do and you know uh, but yeah I I think it would be awesome I think it would be really awesome yeah. you know how many people that say that Emporium needs a good farmer's market a lot and St. Mary's Enough. farmer's market is going away yeah like, that's not happening no really it is yeah uh the Riddles, Marty Riddle and Jean Janine who I know really well uh Marty doesn't want to deal with it this year so he's not doing it Okay. And that's that's usually down by the uh, where the hotel burned, right off of the diamond. Um, what hotel yes. was there like twenty years ago? It burned down. Or it was a German forgot, German but, something? Yeah, but it's a big hotel, like uh, uh, right across the track from the diamond. But he usually has yeah. it there. But I asked this year if they were doing the farmers market, and Janine told me he's not doing it this year. Well, even and last year it was wasn't very good. There wasn't very no, much. No, last year. Market. Yeah, last year last it started year, flacking everybody's off. market wasn't very good because all the farmers had the stuff and nobody was allowed to have people gather more than three at a time. So we had to like yeah. dig out and make bags and do CSAs and pre-sell all our crop and jump through so many hoops because none of the people were allowed to gather. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, but I, I'm I, still I, considered local because I'm in less than a 120 mile radius of Emporium. Oh, so how about I give you my cell phone number and you should call me and we should talk about um, doing a farmer's market. Excellent. I would totally I would be that. up for that. I'm all about doing anything. I would totally be up for talking to you about opening up the uh, kitchen in October and November. So I, I mean, I would put you guys up at the high grade for the two days. You guys come downstairs at the high grade and open up the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. My mom will be like, what? You're staying downtown, not at my house? <laughs> You know like, how many yep. people I have say that to me? I can't stay at your place. My parents would be so pissed off. And then the and other no, my parents day, would kick my butt. <laughs> no, my, my that'd other, be great. My husband day, would love it. The other half okay, told me. Um, uh, my, oh, go ahead. You can go. So how I don't have this? a pen have to write your name down. Yeah. Can you send his I, information to me? <laughs> yeah. That would be the best bet. All right. Okay. So, uh, Amy, yeah. I really appreciate you inviting me. Um, yeah, did, thank you. Clearly, it did thank wonder you. for us. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Jim, another thought I had about your kitchen when you mentioned your empty kitchen is uh, my daughter tells me all the time about this restaurant in uh, Pittsburgh where um, they have guest uh, chefs kind of like there's like five different stations and it's like they come in for like a cu- three months or something. And Mm -hmm. they have their own little menu for those three months. And then, so it changes all the time because there's different, you know, chefs coming in. And it's more so like the younger ones trying to make a name for themselves or to get practice or whatever. So think about that, you know? Yeah. We actually thought about doing that. And I would like to find, it's really hard. uh, It's really hard to find a chef. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know about six. Yeah, uh, you can find a lot of cooks, and you can find a lot of kitchen people, but you can't find a lot of chefs. And I know about you know six. everybody <laughs> that I found that works. 
that would do something, they said, well, what do you want me to cook? And I would look at them and go, oh, if you want me to tell you what to cook, you're not the right person. Like, right. literally, not I'm not yeah. the chef. The only person that I know that I would, re- and I talked about doing this, um, and he'd probably be willing to do it this year, is John Gusto, who owns the Bear Den. He is mm-hmm. a very good chef. Um, the Bear Den, have you, Amy, have you been to the Bear Den? No. The Bear Den used to be this, like, little crappy hole in the wall, you know, whatever. But it's been closed because he's remodeling. But John Gusto, his father's Rich Gusto, and I went to school with him. He uh, has been a sous chef in, like, three major cities. Uh, he's a really good – and he's a chef. He's not a cook. He cooks everything. He smokes all of his own meat down at the Bear Den. He does everything. And everything there on their menu is, like – important food it's like a burger but everything has a spin on it everything it's not the normal burger it's not the normal you know uh it's not the normal cheese like nothing about it's normal he does everything there he smokes everything he cook he cures all of his own meats for his trays like everything so when he reopens i would highly recommend you go there because it's not what you think it is it's not a bear den that it was 20 and that's where i refer all of my customers our guests Last year, I, but then the pandemic kind of took it a hit because he couldn't take any customers. But he's opening back up this year. But he's the only person that I have hit up because he's really the only person that I think is a chef in Emporium. Everybody else, they cook. Right. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, need to yeah. fruit. We came Here's up a here funny story real lucky. quick. I'm per- pretty sure, Amy, you have to go, and I have to go check on my contractors that are creating my shop right now. But uh, here's a really good twist to that because um, the chef I know up in Erie was part of that undercover Erie. Um, she works for Underdog and here, lo and behold, I taught her in eighth grade when I was a teacher at a Catholic school. <laughs> <laughs> so well, Ashley... If you guys wanted to like push that, cause she's actually the head chef at the underdog barbecue in Erie. And they was, it was a, like, a, uh, what was that? Like a reality show or something. So she'd be a good one to bring into town for a day or two. Oh. Cause she's kind of like the Erie celebrity. <laughs> yeah, I would totally be up for that. If you could, Amy, if you could give her my contact information, Christine, you can call me anytime you want after tomorrow morning because I'm away. I'm on vacation. He's on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I have a thousand tomato baby plants to transplant. So yeah, I can feel it. Yeah. We're I don't busy. think I'm seeing another day off until January 1st. So with the hotel and the gift shop and the Christmas store, I think I'm, we're swamped for the rest of the year. So we figured we'd jump on this. While we yep. Did. Oh, um, I know. All right. Yeah, busy. If you could give Amy or the information, that would be great. And then we're going to credit Amy good with everything that happens good out of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> have right, a good ladies. night or good day. Have a good day. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. You too. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.